Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, so I'm Brian Knopf. Uh, this is Yes, You Can Walk on Water, AppSec on a, uh, and Product Security on Startup Budget. So a little about me. Uh, right now I run a consulting company called Break Security. Uh, I was previously at Linksys and Belkin and uh, I'm one of the researchers is part of the Build It Securely group and also I'm the Cavalry uh, where we focus on IoT and how to build more secure products. Uh, and uh, my background is IT, QA and development and security. So this whole project of building application security really came about from my background in QA where I was running uh, quality assurance for Belkin and we had a bunch of products, not too many but enough that it kept us busy and then uh, we got notice that we were going to get, uh, we were acquiring another company called Linksys and I thought great, they've got to have a security team, right? Nope. Well Cisco's got to have a security team, right? Nope. So we have four times as many products, uh, no security and uh, no problem, right? So out of necessity we built an application and product security team basically with no budget, little number of staff and so we're going to talk through how you do that when you're on the defensive side. So this is what we started dealing with. Thanks Jacob and, uh, and crew. Uh, on a daily basis we'd get notifications like this. Root level access on shell, you know, on, on routers, taking over our devices, don't use our devices. That was becoming a daily event for us. Death trap Wemo. Uh, you know, someone turning on and off our devices using local vulnerabilities. Security flaws in UPnP. So this became more of a regular problem and my work doing QA was taken away from the time I was doing security. So at that point I had a little conversation with my boss about taking over just security. Uh, and he agreed and gave me a, a huge budget. No money. So a bunch of products, no money and somehow we're supposed to squeeze AppSec, product sec and incident response out of that. No big deal. So why no budget for application security on IoT devices? Well, it comes down to a bunch of things. One, compliance needs or lack thereof. There's typically no PII or PCI on these devices. So manufacturers don't want to spend money where they don't have to. So if there's no regulatory or compliance needs for it, they're not going to spend. Um, most of these devices, if you look at Kickstarter and starter projects, they're very low margin. You get a bunch of developers who get a small amount of funding and they try and build these devices. So it becomes very hard to throw security into that mix as well. And quite frankly, a lot of the companies don't understand the need. If you look at Linksys, a lot of the same people had been there for decades. They never needed to do security before, so why should they start now? And so changing that culture becomes very difficult when you have people who said, well, we just ignore the, the researchers and they'll go away. Well, they don't go away and, and that has to change. And so, some, you know, security by obscurity is obviously not something we should ever be doing. So if you've ever talked about offense versus defense, I love this slide because, you know, offensive security, it's easy. It's like shooting fish in a barrel, right? You just pick whichever volume you want to go out and it's probably on half the devices you're going to look at, if not more. Whereas defensive security, you're trying to protect a device against way more resources that are well more funded and have a lot more time on their hands if you're dealing with a bunch of products. So now what? What do we do? Well, the first thing actually is pretty simple because it's just getting people to know you actually exist. Just like you do in programming. Hello world, right? So there's a lot of organizations out there that will help you so that people can contact you when they find vulnerabilities. You've got CERT, SANS, uh, bug bounty companies, listings. You create your actual email addresses for security. Give the researchers a way to actually communicate with you. Right? How do they get to you? Through Twitter, right? Facebook if you need, setting up a website. Because the first part is researchers are going to go look for a way to contact you if they have a vulnerability. If they can't contact you, most likely that vulnerability is going to go public. So as long as you give them a way to get to you easily and a way to respond, 
they're going to come to you and give you the right information. The second part sounds a lot easier than it is, but it's assess. Assess what? Assess what you're looking at. So what are you protecting? Home automation, devices, right? Is it a light bulb? What's the risk of the device? Who wants to actually attack this device? Um, what's their motivation for it? You know, is it just trying to figure out where you're going? Is it my car and I want to find out how fast this person's going, where they're going, when they're at certain locations? Or is it my banking information? Uh, I did another presentation about my wife, but this is my wife, not a light bulb, right? Uh, if someone hacks my light bulb, they turn it on and off. That's my wife and that's the medical device in her back. If someone hacks her, she dies, right? It's an electrical stimulation device to do, provide pain management. And that's not trying to be a shocking statement. It's, it only does two things, on and off, and change the voltage, right? So the protection potentially on this kind of device is a lot different than the devi another device that you would, you know, maybe like my kid's Skylanders, which have NFC cards in them. So understanding what you're looking at, who's trying to attack it, what the potential is, and how you need to approach security. This is one of the products I've worked on. So you look at this and say, what can I exploit here? R show of hands, how many people are AppSec people here? Security researchers? IT security? No? Okay, so this is a piece of hardware and, and so there's software attacks and there's hardware attacks. This is the Wink Hub, one of the products I worked on. It was released last year. Right after it was released, it was hacked within a month. Um, the Wink team was very uh, willing and interested in doing security, but no, ever, never, no one ever sat down with them and said, here's what you need to do before you release hardware. So if you look at this device, uh, it's got some fun things on it. Uh, everyone here familiar with JTAG? JTAG, UART, GPIOs. This board is basically a, uh, a fantasy for a researcher, right? Everything's laid out, it's documented really clearly so that it, you know, makes it easy to find what you're looking for. So if you're doing defense, if you're building hardware, the first things you want to look at is what do I need on this board? Do I need the GPIOs exposed? Is there a reason to have a UART so that someone can solder on a serial port? Because they will. Now we came from a software background and I didn't do a lot of hardware professionally until I got to Belkin and the first thing that happened is they soldered on a serial port and got root access. Nice. So lesson learned, right? But you can grab a bus pirate and connect to a eight different parts on this board. The question is, does it need to be there? You've got a NAND there that you can pull off and, and use in an EEPROM reader. Does it need to have its pins exposed? Can you epoxy over it? What can you do to protect that device? So first, understanding what you're looking at, right? Go look at other devices that are similar. What kind of attacks have happened on those devices, right? There's a thousand cameras out there. There's a thousand camera hacks out there. If you're trying to build a camera and defend against it, understand what other people have done on those cameras so that you know what not to do. Uh, check versions of apps and libraries. Now this is really interesting because especially when you're dealing with a lot of products, there's a lot of third party libraries that will be in your code. Some by the manufacturer, some by uh, that you actually implement, some by the chipset. If you just catalog these, when you have a vulnerability or when you see a vulnerability that comes out, open SSL, open SSH, you can very quickly go down your list and say, here's what I'm running in each of my products. Now I know very quickly whether I need to up update, patch something, rather than panic mode sets in. And what I'll tell you about this is from the Belkin standpoint, when we had an issue with, uh, with Heartbleed, or we didn't have an issue with Heartbleed, we very quickly went down the list and said, what of our products have open SSL in it? Especially the branch that was vulnerable. And within five minutes, and I'll thank Amanda who's sitting back there because it was actually Amanda who did it, uh, she had a list of every uh, uh, library that was in every one of our products. Within five minutes, we could tell that we had no impact on Heartbleed, at least from our standpoint. It becomes really easy to look at your security if you know what you have in there. 
You know, if you don't have something like Black Duck, an expensive application for doing GPL code, talk to your, your developers. Look in the code and find out what libraries are there, right? They're probably in one simple little folder. Find out what versions there are, document them. It doesn't have to be that complex, but know what you're dealing with. Makes it really easy to react. Threat model everything. Raise your hand if you're familiar with the threat model. I would hope there's a lot. Okay. Not as many hands as I would like, and it's kind of scary. So if you asked me to, to come into your house and tell you how someone could break in, right? I'd come over to your house, I'd look at the doors, the windows, the, anything that's an interface. It's the same thing with application security and product security. What are the ways you can get into my application, right? Wireless, uh, serial, Ethernet. So this threat model shows trust boundaries. Uh, I've had to sort of change it because obviously I have to protect what the real model is here. But so these are servers. In the center, you'll notice there's a rectangle with two servers in it. In this particular case, there was a load balancer that was balancing internal and external resources. So if someone overloaded the load balancer, they take out everything, right? So if you're looking at that, is there a reason why that needs to be the same for both? Well, what's the trust boundary? What accounts are used for we what servers? How do you protect that? How do you mitigate the risk of when someone does attack because they will and they will be successful, how do you make that attack smaller? What are the ports that are used? If you're not using SSL, why not? If you have the same service or multiple services running on different systems, why? Can you separate them out and protect it? If you're writing data to a server and then you are taking that data and manipulating it later, can you separate the accounts that are used so you have read accounts and write accounts and they're separated out so if someone hijacks the application, they're not able to read some of the data. They can write what they used to have before or what data they're allowed to, but they're not picking up data they shouldn't be. Pen tester versus bug bounty or is it really verse? Uh, raise your hands. I, I think some people said, who are the pen testers in here? AppSec, pen testers? No? Bueller? All right. So pen testing is really, really critical for any application security. You have, you know, code checks that need to be done early in advance, but you also have to have someone else look at it from a holistic perspective. You can hire one pen tester and it'll cost you between 10 and 20K per week per pen tester. Or you can do a bug bounty or you can do both. And so if you look at the cost, it's about 10 to 20K for one pen tester. Uh, it's about the same amount for 20, 30 people to do a bug bounty that all have different backgrounds, different experience, and different e expertise. So do you want to leverage more people with more expertise or do you want to focus that on just a single entity? Well, for me, you have to do both. Right? You need internal people or external people to work together to be looking at the whole application. But you also need to be able to leverage the external community, right? Security researchers who focus on, on particular vulnerabilities. Policies and controls. Who has access to what hardware? And if you're in a startup, I bet your developers have access to production. And the question is, do they really need it? So how do you look at things like server access, hardware requirements, to make sure that you can separate those out. Um, you know, source code access, the firmware images. A lot of times what people are doing are pulling down the firmware from your site and actually looking at the code itself, right? They don't even bother with the device. If you can reverse engineer the firmware that's sitting there, then you can find out everything it's doing. So then we get into supply chain. So one of the most interesting things with IoT that's very different than, say, operating system security is the way the supply chain is, is handled and the way that the stack is owned. Because it's not just the way it used to be with application and operating system. With the IoT stack, it's a lot more people involved and it's a lot harder. So from a researcher perspective, if you know where to look, you know how to get the right volumes. From a defense standpoint, you have to look at how do I protect everything that's in this piece of hardware, not just protect my stuff. Securing the SDLC. So if you're going to do full-blown SDL for Microsoft, great, right? But it takes a lot of effort. But how do you do that on a smaller scale? What are you really looking for? Well, the OWASP top 10 is a great place to start. So if you look at something like the web application or web defender's handbook, 
how do you mitigate particular attacks, right? In the case of an IoT device, you typically have an embedded hard piece of hardware. You've got a web server running. You may have a cloud environment. You've got the APIs and the mobile app. It's a lot of attack surface, which means you should be looking all the way through that code, secure functions, right? Early in uh, evaluation of that throughout the process. And it also means training your QA and your developers on how to threat model, how to test for security, and how to really evaluate the product. Especially if you're a small security team, there's no way you can do it, so you need to help get help from others. And then static and dynamic analysis of the code, looking for actual vulnerabilities from the uh, code flaws. So Microsoft has this, this SD3 plus C, right? And you would think that this is known because this has been around for a decade, but uh, if you look at the vulnerabilities that come out from researchers, how many times do you see a camera with the default username and password, right? Secure by design, right? Do you separate out the code so that if someone gets access to one function, they don't automatically get root access and have access to everything? Analyzing the threats, vulnerability reduction, right? If there are ports open that aren't needed, close them. If there are services running that aren't needed, close them. If it's if it's embedded Linux firmware and you're using BusyBox and BusyBox has everything that comes with the distribution and you don't need it, pull it out, right? Pull out everything and put it back one at a time and see what you really need on the, on the device. Secure by default, right? Uh, we had a feature at, at Linksys um, which was OpenVPN. Cool feature but we probably figured 2% of our users would actually use that feature. So turn it off by default. If they want to turn it on, the users that need it will actually enable it. Otherwise, you're just opening a port, you're opening a service that can be attacked. And then secure and deployment. And this goes back to a vulnerability that really got me into security research where HD Moore was looking at cameras. And what he found is that the cameras by default didn't auto answer, but the IT teams that were deploying them were turning them on to auto answer to everything. So the security was built in by the manufacturer, but the IT team actually did exactly what they shouldn't have done. They disabled the security. So make sure when these are devices are being deployed, right, do you really want your egg timer hacking your IT environment? And then communication, make sure everyone knows. So why protect our supply chain? So this is something that I've talked to researchers about where they send us a vulnerability and they say, hey, you haven't fixed it, it's been 45 days. And I usually respond, well, that's great, but I haven't even had a build yet. So this is how an IoT device works, it's a little different. First you get the chipset SDK. And that chipset SDK, you know, whether it comes from Broadcom or, or one of the other chip vendors, has communication libraries in it. <coughs> if you think of a vulnerability recently in the last couple years, the UPnP vulnerability was a chipset SDK vuln. The mini UPnP was part of the chipset SDK package. So as a manufacturer, we didn't have access to modify that, right? But it's still in our code, we're still responsible for it. Then you've got the board support package. Right, that's your, your bootloader that the ODM gives you, your original development manufacturer, any drivers for the specific hardware, and support software. When we say support software, what we really mean is backdoors. And so let's be very clear on this. Most of the time the backdoors that you hear about in IoT devices are in the board support package. The original intention of that code is to verify off the production line what that hardware is doing. Is the MAC address program right? Is the serial number correct? Does the serial port work? Do the lights work properly? But what ends up happening is a lot of those tools have other features like root access to the command line. The question is why is it there? And if it needed to be there for, for testing, does it need to be there once it goes to production? The clear answer is no. And then you've got the manufacturer code, the firmware and the UI. So from a researcher perspective, if you start looking at vulnerabilities and you find, hey, Linksys has a vulnerability, the question is, is it really a Linksys vulnerability or is it an Edimax, an Arcadian, CERCOM, or any one of number of, of ODMs that are used by tons of vendors? Asus, Netgear, D-Link, they're using a lot of the same ODMs. So if you focus the right place and it looks like it's drivers, then maybe you need to look at other devices that have the same chipset or other devices that came from the same ODM and look at that code. And what you'll find is if you put the pressure in the right place, we can get things fixed a lot easier. 
monitoring and force. So if you're trying to build an AppSec and, and, uh, and product security team, there's a lot of tools out there. But clearly, if you're trying to prove the, the, the point, you don't necessarily have the budget. Lots of tools don't work together. You may not even have the staff to run it, right? Um, especially when you get into operational security. If the tool takes five people to run, you've met the entire Linksys uh, security team when we started. There were two of us. Right? We didn't even have the bandwidth to run some of these tools. So we needed to look at what we could do with what we did have and who we could leverage. Um, and even if you spend $20 million, when I was at Rapid7, we talked to these customers and they would, they'd get hacked and they would talk about all the things they bought, their IDS, their IPS, their firewalls, right, and anything that they needed or anything that they were told to buy. But if you don't know how to use it, it doesn't prevent attacks, right? Even if you have it and know how to use it, it doesn't prevent attacks. So other things like appliances, right? Security vendors love appliances. But if you're using virtualized hosting, you can't use them, right? You also have to understand what's the model of, you know, if you're looking at Amazon, what does Amazon protect versus what do you protect, right? What's the balance of, of security and who owns what? So measuring, how do you measure your application security and product security program? Well, what, do you, what can you report on from what's being deployed, right? How many vulnerabilities are happening in your code? As you build your program and you're checking the source code, how many are you finding early in the process versus how many are you finding late? What's your, your scale look like for, uh, for your incident response, right? Is it spiking up or are you getting a lot of those vulnerabilities early in the process now? Uh, you know, security event analysis becomes very difficult if you don't have a lot of resources. But I'm pretty sure most IoT teams have some analytics team, right? So what we did is we looked at, well, we've got some data analytics. We know what reports we need to look at. We'll have them build them, right? So if we see an account that shouldn't be on server one, but suddenly gets transferred to server one, after a bunch of failed logon attempts in server two, it should be a red flag, right? So if you have a data team that can grab the logs for you, use them to help you build your monitoring for security. You don't need to go out and spend $2 million if you don't have that budget. You can, you know, there's no reason to, to use it as an excuse. So one of the companies I worked at was Linksys and Belkin. So this is a bit of a case study on how we built security there. So we had no budget, we had limited monitoring and controls in place. We kept on getting these ODM vulnerabilities. Um, how many have heard of the moon malware? Anyone? No? So we had the moon malware, we had an open SSH, open SSL, which didn't affect us very much, but these were becoming a regular occurrence. So there's two of us and we figured, all right, we've got to be able to do something. So we also were doing limited tools, limited automation. Um, it was mostly a manual process. So first we create an incident response, right? Let's just make sure that people can communicate with us, right? If a researcher reaches out, they want to submit a vulnerability to them, we rewarded them. We gave them new hardware, right? You found something on EA2700? Great. Here's our brand new router. Go have fun with it. Um, the response we would get is, you know, people would, were happy that we wanted to talk to them. We didn't threaten them. We didn't tell them to go to hell. I mean, you know, there was no security by obscurity. Um, we also started reverse engineering the code that was got, getting from the ODMs. And this is where it got a little interesting and a little scary for us. So the contract that we had says we're not actually allowed to look at their code. But we know that there were backdoors in it because of re security researchers releasing information elsewhere. So we started looking at the code. And we actually got a little lucky because we had one of our engineers who was on site at this ODM and saw this manufacturing tool and took a screenshot of it. And when we started looking at it, what we realized is they had a lot more and a lot scarier things than, than what we realized. Uh, the ODM tried to justify this code, that it was for, you know, validating the product and that they needed to keep it. And they actually did some pretty sketchy things to try and keep that code there, but Luckily, uh, they were caught. Um, in fact, they, what they tried to do is, is they took an executable and they made it a library so that they could call it and try and hide it from us. But so we started mandating that, they, that all of our ODM vendors 
would basically undergo code audit. So any libraries, any SDKs they gave us had to go through a full security audit. They could choose the, uh, uh, the, the vendor that they went through from approved vendor list. Um, and as expected, what happened is they all pushed back. So we thought about it and, and tried to figure out how do we leverage the rest of the company to make sure this happens. Well, it turns out the purchasing department has a lot of pull. So we went to them and talked to them and said, all right, we really need to enforce this with the ODMs. We've got five or six of them we're dealing with. Can you help us enforce this? And what we found is they would just go to the ODMs and say, guess what? We've got five projects that are coming up. If you want this project, you're going to do this. Otherwise, there's four other ODMs that are willing to, to do this already. So we may not have had the staff to do it ourselves, but we leveraged legal. We leveraged purchasing and other departments to help us. Um, we deployed password management, made sure that the source code access was strong, made sure that whoever was accessing any of our documentation, that laptops were getting encrypted or getting protected, and maintained library list versions so that we could very easily respond. So when Heartbleed came out, the only reason it was a five minute response for us was because we had that list. The Links is SKU list was something around 400 devices. If you counter, uh, if you figure out, you know, there's 20, 30 devices and then there's versions for every single country, right? So that's a long list to go through to figure out if you've got a library phone every time one comes out, right? But it's a really easy Excel spreadsheet once you put it together. So the massive, uh, massive uh, vuln we had. So. We had a, uh, an ISP in Idaho, I believe it was, that contacted us and said that they were seeing a huge amount of traffic on port 80 uh, and it was only their Linksys deployed devices in homes that were, they were seeing it on. And about the same time, SAN started picking this up. Uh, it very quickly put, took on the name the Moon Malware. And it was one of the first self-replicating malware that we had seen. So essentially what it was doing is it was infecting the, uh, the routers using URL injection be because it dropped the temp file and then was picking that temp file up. And then it was scanning the entire internet for other routers of the same model. So that once one was infected, it would continue scanning for others. And every time it picked up another router, they would each start scanning. So this was a memory resident vuln. When you rebooted the, the router, the vuln was gone. Except within minutes it got scanned again and infected. So every time you, you rebooted a, a device, it kept on getting repaired and infected. Now, the, the malware author in this was basically just doing Bitcoin mining, but what could they have done? Well, they could have done pretty much anything because they had access to look at all the traffic. Um, so Amanda very quickly learned how to reverse engineer code, um, which is uh, you know, kind of one of the other points. If you're building the AppSec team, you want to get the right people, right? People who are passionate about security, who are willing to learn, who are in incentivized, right? Who really enjoy learning. They were targeting nine SKUs and a million total devices. And I bet the guy's kicking himself now because what he really had once we figured it out was 31 SKUs and 15 million devices were vulnerable. Would have been the second largest botnet in history according to, to the sources we looked at. So we did some Shodan searches really quick, started seeing, uh, you know, started seeing the large number of devices that were still deployed, which was a handy tool for us to use. The problem we encountered is only two of the 31 uh, SKUs were in support. We had just bought Linksys and I had to go to the executive management and say, guess what? Every one of our devices is vulnerable that we just picked up. I was not exactly the most uh, popular person in the, uh, in the boardroom that day. Um, we decided to fix all 31. And this was 100 pages at least per device and it took us roughly seven months. Uh, but when we talk about how do you prove application security, how do you get leverage for it? Well, we had been saying all along that we're spending a lot of money re-architecting when we have these kind of vulnerabilities. And that if we had just done proactive approach to finding security vulns, if we were looking at the code, if we were looking at pen testing, if we were looking at bug bounty programs, we wouldn't have all this re-architecture. This was the first time that they, they started listening and realized that we spent seven months fixing products that had pretty, were pretty old. But if we did this on new products, it would make us a lot more effective. We wouldn't spend all this time you know, re-architecting them, patching them. What we'd spend our time on is building new features. 
<clears throat> so then I, I moved on to Wink. And I thought, well, I had a decent sized security team uh, when I left Belkin of four people, roughly, uh, which was double what we started with. Now I'm going to try it with a company that really had even less resources, but they were a lot more willing. So th they had done some pen testing. And uh, raise your hand if you're familiar with the Wink Hub. Anyone? So the Wink Hub is a, it has six radios in it. It is a IoT hub that you can communicate with all your devices. You can control them all. And a month after it was released, it was rooted uh, at DEF CON last year. Just fantastic timing. Uh, the developers, though, when I, when I talked to them, they were all interested in security. They wanted me to teach them secure coding. They wanted to learn how to do threat models. They were passionate about it. They just didn't know how to do it. So that was great. Developers bought in. What about the company? So I talked to the executives, and not only do they want to do security, they wanted to be able to contribute code back to open source. They wanted to be able to help their partners. So they were fully bought into it. And for me, that was fantastic. So I joined up. Every single developer on the development team learned how to do a threat model. Um, I was the only security person on staff. So there's no possible way I could have done uh, threat models and code audits of every feature and product that they were working on. So the developers did it. We leveraged them. Not only do they want to do it, we'd have five or six sessions for any threat model. Right? They'd start recommending things that they should change in the code, things that they, sh they should change in the infrastructure. The data team got on board with it. Um, we built a, a data model for consumers so they could actually see, hey, here's how we're collecting your data, here's what we're using it for, here's how we share it. So that it wasn't just security we're looking at, but privacy as well. We created a bug bounty program we created security at Wink so that people could, could communicate with us. There were security websites for consumers. There were security websites for researchers. How do you submit vulnerabilities to us? For a consumer, what, what products are vulnerable? How do you patch them? What's the updated firmware? What do you need to know? Uh, and then something interesting started to happen. We started to find vulnerabilities, and before I'd even asked the development team to fix them, they were patched. Because not only do they care, they, realized, they started realizing the implication. And we had things that were being patched faster than I ever had expected before. So we did a bug crowd bug bounty. And I thought, well, we had some limited pen testing from external resources. But what I'd really like to see is I want to see people who are really IoT experts that are going to hammer on this thing. Now, I continued a program that I had at Belkin where any time a researcher would submit a vulnerability, I'd give them free hardware. Because where I didn't have money, I did have product. And so the Wink Hub was $50. Didn't matter to me if I sent out 100 of them, right? If there was a researcher interested, I gave it to them for free. Because if you're looking to do research and you've got product in your hand as opposed to going to buy product, you're more than likely going to look at it. So we got 26 researchers. Now, when we did this, I made sure that not only had they done bug bounties for IoT before, but they had actually submitted and not just weak vulnerabilities, that they had submitted sever high severity vulnerabilities so they knew what they were talking about. We got 26 hand-picked researchers that were some of the top IoT researchers around the country. Two weeks, and we got 14 unique submissions. The total cost was 15300 Now, if you think about that, when I talked about a pen tester, one pen tester for two weeks is between 10 and 20 k So I... For, the, for, for a very similar value, I got a lot more out of it. And that doesn't mean I wouldn't hire pen testers to, do, to work on the product. What it means is you supplement. Because you're going to get a lot different exposure from pen testers than you are from bug bounty. Right? Everyone looks at things differently. So what we got is a significantly more secure device. Their reward for that, aside from cash, was I sent them more free product. But let's talk about the vulns for a minute. Because these weren't little vulns. So one of the researchers, uh, his name is Anshuman, found a vulnerability uh, which is a, an interesting logic flaw that comes up. So our developers made sure that the user was valid. They made sure the hub was valid. What they didn't make sure is that the hub was valid for the user. So <laughs> this researcher went in and went, oh, look, I can delete every user's hub for all accounts. Went, Perfect. That's exactly what you look for in a bug bounty. The things that we didn't validate in QA. So this is where I really enjoy working for companies that 
are passionate about security. I entered the bug into our defect tracking system. I then went and called my boss. After that I called the developer who informed me meant they already had the vulnerability, uh, a patch on staging and were minutes away from deploying it to production. From the time that we actually read the vulnerability to the time it was pushed to production was one hour. I, that's something you can never ask for. I mean, I was blown away. I mean, not only were they, they excited about this, but they were actively w not waiting for me. They were going and, and patching these things themselves. Uh, and then we had uh, DAC S uh, XSS who found another account takeover. And again, this one was patched in, uh, in an hour as well. And what it showed is not only were the, was the team willing to learn, they understood the implication of these vulnerabilities now. They understood that they couldn't wait around and they were, they were pulling people in in the middle of the night doing, you know, regression tests, right? If you explain to the developers the impact of what this means, if they see it as, as a real vulnerability, they understand how someone could exploit it in the wild, then what you find is they'll become really passionate about fixing them because no one wants their code exploited like that in the wild. So here's one of the things, to, to, to really build a successful program, it's about the communication. It's not just communication with researchers, it's the communication with the public. Um, security isn't something that needs to be hidden. The old model of security by obscurity, it doesn't work. The customers don't trust you, the researchers don't trust you. It's really simple to go to a researcher and say, you know what, I know you submitted a vulnerability to me, I really do want to fix it, but I can't fix it in 45 days because I can't even get the build, right? It has to go to the ODM, it's not an excuse. It's getting to understand the process because once they understand the process, then they go, oh, this guy's not playing around. He knows about security. He's trying to fix it. They just can't fix it as fast as I'd like. And so Jacob, who, uh, who was here a couple minutes ago, submitted a bunch of vulnerabilities to us at Linksys. And I said, look, you know, the ODM doesn't even give me a build for 60 days. So there's nothing I can do, but we're working on it. We're taking it seriously. It's probably going to take us 90 days at a minimum. We've got to get it to QA. We've got to get the right things changed. And it changed the conversation. It was no longer an adversarial thing. It was oh, you're not just trying to get me to go away, you're trying to help us fix it as well. If you're open and transparent with researchers and your customers, they're going to appreciate it. We created the security at Wink site, um, one for consumers, again, how to patch, what, what issues there were. We also created the, uh, the one for researchers on how to submit. Create an email address, Twitter account, bug bounty on bug crowd, any way that a researcher could think that they wanted to submit to us, we wanted to make sure we made it easy. And then we also kept our partners informed. Now we had partners like Dropcam, Nest, but not everyone has a security team like they do. So the smaller vendors that were, that were putting products on our infrastructure, they didn't have security teams. They didn't know how to do this. So we taught them. How do you secure your products? How do you lock down the hardware? Right? How do you make sure that you're doing device pinning, right? So that certificate pinning, so that your firmware is secure. And what we found is they were more willing to work with us. They wanted to work with us rather than other people because we were willing to help them grow. And also we were protecting their brands, not just ours. Right? If they get compromised and it goes through our system, then it affects us. If we're protecting our device and then we're helping them protect theirs, well, it's adding to the value of the relationship. Um, we help them improve security. We help them by testing their products as well, and especially the integration. Proactive identification. And this is really, you know, if you do this right, this is where the majority of your vulnerabilities will, will be found. Looking at the code, right? Internal and external pen testing. Implementing security development lifecycle, right? Secure functions. Uh, making sure that, you know, code's being escaped that, you know, throwing invalid data at it, doing fuzz testing, right, Wireshark. I mean, looking at everything that a researcher is going to look like, at, you know, can you solder on something to the device? Can you, uh, you know, get access to the, you know, to something that, you know, through a URL? Looking at the vendor supply chain, right, um, what is the code that they're giving you? What's in it? What can you do with it? And, Additionally, ongoing research. Now, the reason for the ongoing research is you're building on certain protocols. And what we found is some of the protocols we were building on, there was a lot of assumptions made by the vendor. Uh, we talked to one of our vendors about Zigbee 
And they were talking about smart energy, but they weren't talking about Zigbee HA, which has very different security requirements. So make sure you're looking at what you're using, what the, the security research that's going on in the community, so you know what kind of things that, that are, input, you know, that could potentially affect your device. In the case of Zigbee, we wanted to make sure that uh, we could update the devices because Zigbee uh, HA 1.3 and 1.3.1 had improvements for security. And if we put out 1.2 or 1.2.1, then essentially we're selling devices that someone would have to physically replace once those new specs came out. Innovation. So security really doesn't have to be hard. And I talk about this social contract standpoint. If you invite someone to your house to, to watch your house where you're gone, you physically hand them the key. And from an IoT device standpoint, it shouldn't be any different. If I want my door lock to talk to my light switch so that when I open my door, the lights come on, I'm essentially, there's a, there's a social contract where I'm saying, I want this device to talk to this device. Now, why don't we have key pairing, key exchange that happens there and only those devices communicate? And if you look at a lot of the IoT devices, once you're on that network, you have access to everything. So the router is not your security model, nor should it ever be your security model. Assume the network will be compromised because we know it will. How do you build security for that device knowing that will happen and making sure that you protect anyway? Uh, and really, the, the thing that's really missing in IoT is every one of these devices is a different pairing model. They're difficult. They're not really secure. How do we make it from, a, from an industry standpoint where you protect these devices, pair them securely so that you make sure that someone's not taking over that device? So the conclusion of this is really there's no excuse for not running security. It doesn't matter if your budget is 5,000 or 5 million. Whatever your budget that you work with, Figure out what you can do to protect. Work with external researchers. Give them free products. When you build an IoT device, you typically get 50 dev versions of it, right? Well, you typically don't need that many for the QA team and the, and the security team. Give them out to researchers. Have them sign an NDA so that they'll get, you know, tell them, look, we'll give you vulnerability disclosure once we fix the issue, right? But we want you to look at it. And we're going to give you free hardware. Uh, teach everyone threat models, not just the developers. Teach the PMs. Let them understand how, to, how it works, right? Because until they start understanding what the true threat of this is and the probability, they're not going to help you, right? They're going to push back and say, oh, it's just, it's hurting us usability. Uh, researchers are to be thanked, not threatened, right? Once you start treating researchers like friends, they're going to help you. They're going to give you more time to fix things. They're going to be more willing not to, to bash you in the press. Um, and they're going to make your product stronger. And the, the biggest thing is be honest and transparent. When you screw up, you screw up. There's a couple times we gave the wrong researcher credit. We owned up to it. Posted on Twitter, hey, we screwed up. Or, you know, we had a, an incident response process and we did it wrong. We're sorry. We fixed it. Right? Uh, try not to let the legal team and the PR team cover that for you. Because people respect you a lot more for it. And then once you start getting the program running, show management what you saved. Security is not a cost center. It's a cost savings. And once you start changing the, the conversation that way, what you'll understand is how much time did we not spend re-architecting the product? Because you take an incident like our moon malware. We spent seven months. Well, we looked at the severity of that vulnerability and said, look, we caught five of these kinds of things in early detection. That would have cost us X. And that's how much we saved. You know, the management's going to ask you, if you spend X, how many, what's the percentage that I'm not going to get hacked? Well, unless any of you here are Karnak, there's no way you're going to actually understand that, right? There's no probability there. But what you can tell them is what you saved in the actual testing time saved, what features you're able to build. So uh, thanks, uh, especially to Amanda and the team at Linksys, uh, they, uh, and, and Wemo. Um, you know, we are, had to grow a team really quick. Um, also to the Wink team who was very passionate about security. Um, if you need more information, you can check out uh, a couple of the research groups I'm part of, the I Am The Cavalry group, Build It Securely. Uh, Build It Securely has got a re lot of resources if you're building IoT devices on how to protect them from mobile, from cloud, from hardware. And, uh, and that's it for me. Thanks.